Without further ado, please help me welcome Andrew Sykes. I'm the youngest of eight children. In my family, there are four very well-behaved girls and four very badly behaved boys. People that knew her said that my mom was a saint for putting up with all of us. Now she said that on average, her children were pretty normal, which is why she loved us all completely and equally. Although I'd like to think she loved her youngest just a little bit more equally, despite the fact that I was by far the naughtiest child. I once made my mom so angry that she said, Andrew, if you weren't my son, I wouldn't let my children play with you. <laughs> Ouch, mom. You might wonder why my mom even had eight kids, or as some people would say to her, Mrs. Sykes, why did you stop at eight? And she would stand and clutch her handbag and smile and say, well, we only had eight seats at the dinner table. <laughs> and then my older brother, Greg, whose nickname is Moose, would say, oh, mom just kept having more kids until she saw Andrew, and she was so disgusted, she stopped. <laughs> now, I have my own theory. I think my mom just kept having kids until she got it right. I am very grateful to my mom for teaching me all of my good manners and to my dad, and especially for my good habits, because I learned my bad habits from my brothers and especially from Moose. Which is why when I was just six years old, I had my first cigarette. <laughs> just six years old. Now, I know what you're thinking. Where can I get that awesome haircut? <laughs> You see, when we were kids, we played in a big yard. And one day, I was walking around the back of the yard when I saw my brother, Moose, puffing on a stolen cigarette. When he saw me, his face went from shock to fear. He was worried that I'd tell my mom. And so his quick reactions kicked in. And he said to me, hey, want to puff? <laughs> I really did. So I took that cigarette and took a long, slow draw like I saw them do in the movies, and then held it in and slowly started to turn green. And then I coughed my lungs out. <laughs> Terrible. And I decided that day I would never again smoke another cigarette. And then just about three months later, I was the kid offering my friend Tyron his first cigarette. And so began what became a decades-long smoking habit for myself and for my friend Tyron. By the time I got to college, I was smoking a pack a day. As you heard, I studied to become and qualified as an actuary. That's someone who studies the science of mortality. That's the science of what kills us. And so I knew better than anyone I know that smoking kills, and that knowledge made absolutely no difference to me. Maya Angelou said, do your best until you know better, and when you know better, you'll do better. As wise as she was, I'm afraid that for most human beings, knowing better has very little to do with doing better. Raise your hand if you've got a bad habit that you've been trying to quit for some time. Be proud and keep your hand up if you know how to quit. Ah. I don't know, you just haven't done so yet. When I turned 21, I started what became one of South Africa's largest and most successful healthcare consulting businesses. I would present to clients on the benefits of health and wellness, including sometimes the benefits of smoking cessation programs. Then I would get in my car, drive to the next meeting, and along the way, smoke three cigarettes. The complete inauthenticity of that it wasn't lost on me, but that too made no difference for me. So we learn to tolerate our bad habits by telling ourselves better stories. My story, I'm not a smoker, just not a smoker. But Andrew, you got a cigarette in your hand. 
ah, I can quit that any time. I'm just a social smoker. I just happen to be a very social person. <laughs> when I was 25, my mom contracted pancreatic cancer. And over nine short months, I saw the most wonderful and vibrant woman slowly lose her light. On the night she died, we got to say our last goodbyes, and I got to say, Mom, I love you. Then she said to me, Andrew, I love you too. And my greatest hope for you is that one day you'll figure out how to sm quit smoking for good. I said, Mom, I promise you, I've had my last cigarette. Three days later, my whole extended family comes together for my mom's funeral. And then we cried together, and then we drank. And at 11 o'clock that, that night, after more than a couple of drinks and the sharing of a thousand wonderful stories about my mom, my elder sister, Bev, said to me, want a cigarette? And without even thinking, I took it and I smoked it and a second and a third before I remembered my promise to my mom. In that moment, I realized that who I had become was a smoker. And that's who I was destined to remain unless I could figure out how to finally change or quit for good. The next morning, I made a new promise to myself that I would do whatever it takes to finally figure out how to quit for good. Now, I wish I could tell you it took a couple of weeks. It didn't. I was actually very good at the quitting part. As Mark Twain said, quitting is easy. I've done it hundreds of times. <laughs> For me, it was staying quit that was the challenge. To help me solve the problem, I founded Habits at Work. And with a group of very smart behavioral researchers, we studied how humans quit and then how humans create new habits. And which habits really make a difference to human performance in life and at work. With these new insights, I did finally quit for good. And along the way, we discovered something that is as true for me as it is for all of us. Who we are and who we become is entirely determined by the habits that we practice. Therefore, if we can learn to change or create new habits, we can become highly capable, powerfully compelling, and irresistibly captivating human beings. In a word, we can become magnetic human beings. And my goal for today is to share with you the three habits that create magnetic human beings and the expert move of using these habits with your customers to build deep and lasting relationships. What are these three habits? Number one, practice with feedback. Number two, ask more questions. And number three, listen with your heart. Three habits that I think you'll agree with me appear to be simple to do, yet as we'll see, are seldom done or seldom done well. How do these three habits create magnetic human beings? Well, if we practice with the intention of getting better, with a coach that knows what excellence looks like, who gives us the right kind of performance feedback, we can become highly capable masters of our chosen craft. Elite athletes like Tiger Woods or rock star musicians like Mick Jagger or standout business people. We are drawn to people that perform at the very highest level of their profession. That's magnetic. If we ask more questions of ourselves and of our customers, we unlock new pathways for action that they'll feel powerfully compelled to take. When they do that, they'll achieve 
previously unimagined results for themselves and for their business, for their life. Who wouldn't want to be around someone that makes us flourish? Because that's magnetic. When we listen with our hearts, not just to what people say they want, but by paying attention, we'll see what they really need. And if we attend to that, people fall in love with us. And they become irresistibly captivated by our presence. We are attracted to people like iron to a magnet that stand out from a crowd from their excellence, that unlock greatness in us through their questions, and that see us for who we really are because they listen with their hearts. Magnetism is not some born-in gift, some natural genius, but a trait built by these three habits. Being magnetic is not something that we are. It's something that we do. Magnetism is a creation, like so many other forms of apparent genius. But you may say, Andrew, can we really create genius level superstars? Can we create this magnetism? At just seven years old, Mozart wowed audiences across Europe with his skills on the piano and the violin. But it's another of his talents or his skills that seems almost more impossible to imagine. And that's the key reason why he was labeled as a genius. Mozart had perfect pitch. He could identify individual notes on any musical instrument. He could even identify the key of your cough or your sneeze. Today, being pitch perfect is much less mysterious, but just as rare. Less than one in 10,000 people have this amazing genius level skill. But in 2014, the true nature of perfect pitch was discovered by a Japanese psychologist named Ayako Sakakibara. Love that name. He conducted a fascinating experiment where he collected together 24 children just four years of age. And over an 18 month period, had them practice identifying individual notes on the piano. But here's the cool part. They only practiced a couple of times a day for just a few minutes. Not a big investment at all. Yet at the end of those 18 months, every single one of these kids had become pitch perfect. They had become a genius. Did Mozart have a gift with which he was born? Did he have some natural genius? Absolutely. But what this study shows is that each of us is born with that same gift of a flexible, adaptable brain with which we can become masters in our chosen craft. And when we do, people will be drawn to each of us to see us perform at the highest level because that's magnetic. But what did these kids do in those five or 10 minutes each day that allowed them to get so good so quickly? By a show of hands, who's an experienced driver? Yeah. On a scale of one to 10, how good are you? How good are you? An eight, pretty good. Anyone on nine? Nine, there's my ride home. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, when I first learned to drive, I was terrible. I had no skill at all. I sat next to my dad who was less than patient and I would lurch forward and brake hard, being a danger to myself and others, getting yelled at him most of the time. Luckily, after a couple of weeks, I got pretty good. I remember I'm driving down the road the window was down. We drive on the right, the other side of the road in our country. That's why I'm doing this. And of course, I was smoking a cigarette. And then I said to myself, I've got this. And from that point on, I drove in order to get from A to B, kind of an automatic. Have you ever driven to work in the morning and you just didn't remember how you got there? That's automatic experience. Now, when I said, I've got this, something interesting happened. And when I look back now over my entire career of driving, these 30 years of experience, mostly on automatic, 
What I now see is that I haven't gotten much better than I was when I was 25 years old. All that time in the car has made me as good as I'm ever going to get. I've reached a plateau. And the same is true in business. Have you ever met someone who's got 20 or 30 or 40 years experience and they're just not that good? In fact, sometimes it gets worse. Now, I know we're in New York today, so I'm guessing everyone in the room has been in a New York taxi, yes? With a cabbie who spends eight hours a day in the car, they've got lots of driving experience. How was that experience for you? When we gain experience on automatic, bad habits creep in that make us worse over time. Now, when I asked you to rate your driving ability, I didn't define the scale. If zero is not being able to drive at all, but 10 is the driving ability of Danica Patrick or Mario Andretti, would you still rate yourself an eight or maybe a nine or even above five? See, when we look back on their driving career, even though they too couldn't drive at all when they began, year after year, they've gotten better and better. And today they are maybe five or 10 or 20 times as good as we are. And the question for us is, what explains this enormous gap? Three things. Number one, when we said, I've got this, they said, I want to be great at this. And from that point on, they spent every day driving with the intention of getting better. And indeed, they have. But number two, they have coaches that know what excellence looks like, who guide their practice. How do they do that? By giving them, giving them the right kind of performance feedback. Performance feedback determines not only how quickly we improve, but how good we become in the end. My friend and colleague Craig Wartman and I from the Kellogg Sales Institute recommend a very simple but highly powerful approach to giving the right kind of performance feedback. After a round of practice, my coach will say to me, Andrew, what's one thing you think you did well? And I'll reflect on all of the things that I think I did well, choose the one that I think was the most powerful, and share that answer. Then my coach will say to me, having looked at her notes and chosen for her the one thing that she thinks I did that was most powerful. Andrew, here's the one thing I think you did well. And I'll say, thank you, because feedback is a gift. By beginning with what I did well, we achieve three things. Number one, we focus on what had me stand out. Have you ever heard that saying, if you want to be good, work on your weaknesses? But if you want to be great, work on your strengths. Number two, we build my confidence. And by doing so, we achieve a third thing. And that third thing is that I become primed and open to the feedback that I'll get next, that constructive feedback that I can really use. And then my coach will say to me, Andrew, what's one thing you think you can do differently next time? And I'll go through my mental checklist, and this time I'll choose a thing that I think would be the most impactful, and I'll share that answer. And my coach will go through her notes, choose the one thing she thinks would have the biggest impact for me next time, and she'll say, Andrew, here's one thing I think you can do differently next time. And I'll say, thank you, because feedback is a gift. By ending on what I can do differently next time, we focus on how I can improve, and we build my competence. You see, without confidence, we're afraid to start. And when we do stumble, we give up too early. Without competence, we're destined to fail anyway. And we'll lose motivation as a result. What those kids did in those few minutes of practice each day, when they received this kind of performance feedback, allow them to get really good, really quickly. But of course, all of this depends on us being coachable. 
And my question for you is, how coachable are you? If you were to get this kind of performance feedback today, how much better could you be tomorrow? How much higher could you reach? Could you be 50% better? Anyone in the room could be 50% better with one day's worth of great coaching? Not too many optimists. What about just 20% better? Couple of small hands. OK, what about just 5% better? Anyone at five? I see there's about half the room that are pessimists. 1% better? <laughs> yes. Can we all agree we could at least get 1% better each day? It's a very low and unimpressive bar. <laughs> but here's the thing. Feedback is like compound interest to our talent bank account. And if you today practiced and you got this kind of performance feedback, and you did that every single day for a year, over 240 working days in a year, that compounding effect would leave you 10 times better a year from today than you are right now. Now, if you are today 10 times better than you were a year ago, please stand up so we can acknowledge your coach. OK, we need more coaches in our lives. But you may be saying, Andrew, can coaching really make a difference, like it did for those kids, to how good I become and how quickly I become good? And the answer is yes. Judith Polgar is the world's greatest female chess player ever. She became a grandmaster at just age 15. But what's more impressive is, at age 12, she was already ranked as number one a title she held continuously for 25 years until she retired. That's a record unmatched by any other human being in any other sport. People are drawn to her to see her amazing skills in chess. But I have to say, I pity the man that challenges her. Because in those 25 years, she never once agreed to compete in the Women's World Championship. She refused. Instead, she chose to take on and defeat some of the world's strongest male grandmasters. Her competence was matched by her confidence. And she broke through this gender barrier in chess, paving the way for other women by refusing to believe that women couldn't be every bit as good as men, indeed, a lot better. Now, if you find her impressive, what's amazing is that her elder sister, Susan, is equally impressive. She published her first chess puzzle at age four. She too was a grandmaster by age 15. And she did compete in women's world championships, won a bunch of them and Olympic titles, and at the peak of her career, ranked number two. It's amazing. Now, there is a third sister, Sophia, the middle sister. Always the middle sister, right? When it comes to chess, she's an absolute disaster. She was ranked six. <laughs> now, what do these three amazing women have in common? It's the gumption to take on and defeat anyone. Sophia ranked just six, also dominated in an all-male world. At the 1989 Magistrali di Roma, she chose to take on and defeat not one, not two, but four male grandmasters in a performance that was so powerful, I love this phrase, it's been called the sack of Rome. Do these three amazing women have some natural, born in, innate gift? No. They have the same extraordinary coach, their father, Laszlo Polgar, who's a very interesting guy. See, his coaching of his children was not just born from a love of chess. He's a chess teacher, nor was it born from a desire for his children to do well. See, he's an educational psychologist who studies intelligence. And as a young man, what he found is that all geniuses have one thing in common, or so it seemed. They practiced with the intention of getting better, with feedback from a coach. And to validate this claim, he decides to run an amazing experiment. 
Now he's single at the time and being a very practical guy, he decides that the first step is to find a wife. To prepare for that, he reads the 400 biographies of history's greatest men. Then he starts a courtship of letters with Clara, a foreign language teacher from the Ukraine, who believably agrees to marry him, but kind of unbelievably agrees to participate in this crazy experiment to create their future children as chess champions. <laughs> but what Laszlo proved is that through the right kind of coaching and giving this kind of performance feedback, you can create genius level superstars. That's extraordinary. People are drawn to these three sisters because they perform at the very highest level and that's magnetic. But what can we all do when it comes to, you know, asking people for feedback and enrolling a coach. Well, the expert move is to ask our customers for feedback, to enroll them as our coaches too. A couple of weeks ago, I went to a meeting with one of my customers and she's been a client for a couple of years. So she's used to the drill. At the beginning of the meeting, I said to her, at Habits at Work, as you know, we aim to have every meeting being better than the last. To make sure that happens, could I ask you for some feedback at the end of our meeting today? And she smiled and said, yes, of course. And in that moment, she became not just my customer, but my coach, rooting for me to do better. That completely changes the relationship. Towards the end of the meeting, I started to wrap up with the agreed next steps. And then I said to her, it's time for feedback. May I ask you, what's one thing I did well to serve you today? And she said right away, I appreciated that you had an agenda, you sent it beforehand, and that made the meeting really easy, and you stuck to it, even finishing a little bit early. Who likes to finish early? Yeah. So she was very grateful for that, and I smiled and said, thank you, because feedback is a gift. And then I said to her, what's one thing that I could do differently next time to serve you better? Now that's a hard question for most people and they won't immediately have a good answer. She said, oh, nothing, I think you did a great job. And that's very kind, but you know what we've learned is that we just, if we give people some time to think about it, they often astound us with their answers and that day I was not disappointed. I sat there smiling at her, waiting for her to think of something for what was admittedly a pretty awkward 15 seconds. It felt like an hour. And then her face changed suddenly and it was clear an idea had come to her. She straightened up her body. I could see her summoning her courage. And then she said to me almost apologetically, well, there's one thing you could do differently. She said, my boss, the CEO, keeps track of who subscribed to our newsletter. And she saw that you had unsubscribed. She was right. I had unsubscribed and to a hundred others of our other customers. And so I started to sweat a little bit and I was embarrassed. I started to blush. And then I started to worry that we might lose this client over this. Or that maybe I had a hundred other clients who were annoyed because they had noticed and they had said nothing. So I did the only thing that I'm trained to do. I said, thank you. Because that kind of feedback, man, that is a gift. Because that day, as hard as it was for me to hear that feedback, I got to restore a relationship that I didn't even know was broken. I promised her that I'd resubscribe and I'd done that before I even got to the elevator. And I will never make that same mistake again. I challenge each of you to pick one skill today that you will practice with just a few minutes of time every single day for the next year. Recruit a coach, your manager or your colleague, or even ask your customers to be your coaches. Because remember, experience gained just on automatic is the enemy of mastery. 
practicing with the intention of getting better, with feedback from a coach, that's the genesis of genius. And if you do that a year from today, you will have risen from the crowd. People will be drawn to you to see you perform at the highest level. You will have become magnetic. Our second habit is to ask more questions. Because when you do that, you help people see options that they hadn't seen before. New opportunities, new solutions that they'll feel powerfully compelled to take. And when they do, you'll help them make their dreams come true. If you do that, people will flock to you because that's magnetic. When I first met Steve Panetti in the lobby of a Kempton hotel, he was surrounded by a group of his employees who seemed absolutely mesmerized by his presence. And as I watched, the curious thing was, he wasn't doing much of the talking. And every time I've seen him since then, the same thing is true. Surrounded by a group of employees who just want to be in his presence. And the more I met him, or the more I spent time with him, the more curious I became about why this guy is so charismatic. Now, he's clearly a good-looking guy, right? But he seemed to have something special about him, some kind of secret. And my conclusion was that perhaps his secret was that he is just in the hospitality business, because Steve is a co-founder of the Kimpton Hotel Group. Anyone ever stayed at a Kimpton? What was your experience like? Just blown away. Blown away. What was your experience like? Good? Amazing? Kimpton is known for every hotel providing every guest every day with an amazing, a blowing away but unique experience. They coined the phrase boutique hotel. And ever since, they've been building these unique hotels, creating unique experiences for customers every single day. They have the highest rate of return for shareholders in the industry. They're known as the hotel that is the best place to work for employees. And year after year, they win customer service awards for guest excellence. Now they've got more than 100 properties around the country. And it's easy to look back on this track record of success and assume that it was guaranteed from the beginning. But Steve will tell you that is far from true. In fact, things were so bad in those first years that he literally had to move his family into that first hotel. He couldn't afford to pay rent. And like so many accidents of history, that decision led to a serendipitous discovery because what he saw by being in the hotel at the coalface was that all the decisions made by the board and the senior managers had very little to do with unique experiences. Instead, a unique experience happens at the interaction of guests and frontline employees or indeed all the employees in a given hotel. And fueled by that insight, Steve has spent 30 years going from one new hotel to the next. And what he does when he's there is he asks employees more questions. What do you want for your life? What does your daily schedule look like? What are your habits, your ruts, and your, your routines? Because if you do the same thing over and over again each day, how can you possibly create a unique experience for your guests? But here's his favorite question. What's one thing? that you could do today to make our guests' experiences unique? What's one thing you could do today to make our guests' experience unique? Our employees at Kimpton ask themselves that question every single day and come up with some amazing answers. Have you ever had an amazing idea and you've taken it to your boss or your manager only to have it shot down? How did that make you feel? Not good. And what would you do with your next big idea? Probably not share it. At Kimpton, managers are trained to say yes as a default, even in the face of risk. Not to every idea, but to most ideas. To be open to experimenting, to see what happens. Because as Steve says, if you can dream it, we can do it. When Steve met with a group of employees in housekeeping, he challenged them. What's one thing we could do to make our guest experience unique? 
One employee realized that most guests in a Kempton hotel are business travelers, and they probably missed home. And so thinking about how to solve that problem, her answer to that question was this, a fish in a fishbowl, to soothe travelers' stress and to create a sort of home away from home. Is this unique? Absolutely. But if you were this employee, and that was your idea, how would you feel? That's why Kempton is consistently rated as the best place to work. When Steve met with a group of people in merchandising, he asked them, what's one thing we could put in the room that would create unique experiences for our guests? A female employee had a theory that every woman on the planet, secretly or not, owns at least one item of animal print clothing. Based on that theory, her answer to the question is these. Now, when I go to other hotels, I open the closets, I see those crisp white robes, and I hang up my suit and close the closet again. But when my wife, Maddie, and I stay in a Kempton, I wear the zebra. <laughs> when Steve meets with managers, he challenges them. Because it's not just about these unique experiences. It's also about the bottom line. And the way he challenges them is to fill every bed every night. That's a goal that most other hotels can only dream of achieving. When he talks to managers about how to do that happens, how to make that happen, what he's urging them to do is to be highly creative. And they do that by asking and answering the same question. What's one thing we can do to create unique experiences for hotel buyers. And one manager, realizing that most of her buyers were local, because the bread and butter of her bookings were conferences and events from local businesses, and realizing that local buyers probably got invited to 10 or 20 or 30 events at a hotel each year, and each time they were, they were shown the facilities and given a nice tour, maybe had a drink in the bar or a dinner at the restaurant, or if they were lucky, a cheese and wine in the guest suite. Now, for most of us, that probably sounds pretty good. But if you're a hotel buyer and you're being invited to do that two or three times a week, after a while, all these hotels just sort of blend together and maybe even become a little boring. So this manager's answer to that question was to invite local buyers to her hotel. She took them up onto the roof, and for a couple of hours, they smashed pumpkins onto a target in a top, on a top below. How many of you would like to do that? <laughs> and if you did, would you remember the hotel that created that experience for you? And are you more likely to book your event in such a hotel? Absolutely, because that's unique. Ideas like this help Kempton to fill every bed every night. And they thrill customers with unique experiences. But more than that, when Steve asks employees this question, what's one thing you can do to create unique experiences for our customers? And that question has them unlock new ways of making guests' experiences amazing and making them dream come true. They feel extraordinary about themselves. And that's why they flock to Steve when he visits. That's his secret. Because asking more questions is magnetic. So why don't we all ask more questions? Especially questions of our customers. Maybe it's because we're afraid to be seen as ignorant or stupid for not having all the answers. In fact, many of us think that customers expect us to always have all the answers. Or maybe we worry that they're going to just feel like we're annoying them with asking them too many questions. But research from Brooks and Gino points to a very different conclusion and to our expert move of asking our customers more questions. Because what they found is that rather than ask too many questions, most of us ask too few by far. And we pay an enormous price for that. Why? Because when we ask our customers more questions, we learn more. That's kind of obvious. 
But when we ask them more questions, they also like us more. Why? Because we give them the opportunity to talk about what they like, what they're interested in, their business problems, their challenges, their lives. That self-disclosure feels good, and they attribute that good feeling to us and like us better as a result. In fact, they may even say, what a great conversationalist, not noticing that all you did was ask them questions and they did all the talking. Now, if you're single, I want you to pay close attention. Because in a related study in speed dating, what they found is that people that ask just one more question, not even a good question, just any question, increase their chances of a second date by 5%. Now I see some of you taking notes. <laughs> Whether it's an interview or speed dating, whether you're in sales or customer success or during a negotiation, we tend to think we need to speak more to convince people why they should hire us, why they should work with us, why they should buy from us, when the reality is we need to ask more questions, period. But the most fascinating result of all is they found that people who ask their customers more questions were better, were viewed as more competent and smarter by their customers. Especially if those questions sounded like asking their customers for advice in a subject that their customers already know a lot about. How does that work? And if people ask us for advice in an area that we know a lot about, they're clearly smart because they're asking us. So I challenge you to ask each other more questions, to ask your customers more questions, even counterintuitively, to ask your customers for advice about how to solve their own problems, something you think you've been hired to do for them. Because sometimes having all the answers is not the best answer. But what's the point of asking more questions if we're not prepared to listen? Now, most of us think we're pretty good listeners, right? And we are pretty good. We listen in order to respond. We listen to know when it's our turn to speak. But listening is a little bit like driving. Unless you spend time practicing with the intention of getting better every single day with feedback from a coach that knows what excellence looks like, you tend to simply gain experience on automatic and not become a master of the art. And some people really are masters. I'd like you to think of someone in your life who you consider to be a really good listener. If that's difficult, maybe someone who's just above average. <laughs> How do you feel about that person? How do you feel about them? Um, they, really get me. they get you? How do you feel about them? They help me focus. What's the emotion that you feel about them? Do you like them? Do you respect them? How do you feel? An intimate closeness. An intimate closeness, yeah. We love people that are good listeners because they give us the opportunity to speak about the thing that we love more than anything in the world, ourselves. <laughs> we find them fascinating because they pay attention to us there's that old saying that says, if you want to be interesting, be interested. And we are attracted to interesting people. That's why listening with our hearts is magnetic. But if today you weren't just surrounded by your work colleagues, but in the room were your friends and families and all the people that know you, and I asked them that same question, think of a really good listener, how many of them would say you? See, there's quite a difference between thinking we're pretty good listeners and having other people think we're great listeners. And so the question for us is, what do these master listeners do that the rest of us just don't do? Nelson Mandela won the Nobel Peace Prize, and he is admired as one of history's most respected and extraordinary leaders. But more than that, he was known to be just a fantastic listener. When people were in his presence, 
they felt like they were the only one in the conversation, that he was speaking just to them, even if there were other people in the room, and that he connected with them in a very personal way. Mandela says that he learned to listen from his father, the chief of their village. During a village meeting, he would allow everyone else to speak first before choosing to speak himself. And that has some clear advantages. For one, you get to hear everyone else's perspective and synthesize that before you have to share your own. But the key advantage is that this is a kind of life hack that helps us resist the urge to respond, resist the urge to speak, and in so doing, it gives us the opportunity to listen. Because the first step in listening is to be silent. To listen, begin by being silent. If we begin with being silent, we give ourselves the opportunity to listen. But of course, being silent is just the first step in listening with our hearts, and it's not enough on its own. Have any, any of you been in a conversation with your spouse or your partner or a friend, and they're talking to you, and you're listening, but maybe you're on your cell phone? And then suddenly, out of the blue, they say, you're not listening to me. Has that ever happened to anyone? If it has, just wink at me. OK. Now, if you're smart, what you'll say is, I'm sorry. I wasn't listening, and that's rude of me. And then you'll start paying attention. You'll put your cell phone down. But if you're me, you'll probably try and defend yourself. I say, I was listening. You said that your aunt is mad with your cousin because she's not invited to her niece's wedding. <laughs> I'm curious. Has that ever worked for anyone else? <laughs> Why doesn't that work? Now, to hear what someone says to you so well that you can reproduce it for them almost word for word. Why is that not satisfying? In fact, that makes things much worse. Because listening is not something we do primarily with our ears. That's hearing. Listening is something we do with our eyes. Because to listen means to pay attention. Look it up in the dictionary. To listen means to pay attention. And that's the second step in listening with our hearts. When you judge whether someone is listening to you, you don't look at their ears to see if they're listening. You look at their eyes to see on what or to whom they're paying attention. If listening begins with being silent, it proceeds with paying attention. Because when we do that, we can see what people really need and attend to that. Nelson Mandela was behind bars for 27 years as a political prisoner of the apartheid government in South Africa. And for most of those years, he languished there while the world paid him no attention. But he kept up the struggle. And so did many other people. And eventually, after those 27 years of sanctions being applied and prolonged and intense pressure, eventually, in 1990, he was released. And that day, many South Africans, myself included, took a breath. We didn't know what would happen. I had grown up in the bubble of white apartheid South Africa. And until that time, I had seen no evidence that the endemic racism that plagued our country was disappearing. We were worried, we were scared, we expected that there would be a civil war. And certainly that's what history predicted. But almost immediately, Nelson Mandela went to work negotiating the dismantling of all the apartheid laws. And along the way, there were many setbacks. The Boy Patong massacre, Chris Harney's assassination, and a bunch of car bombs and other violent events that just set back the negotiations and derailed them completely. Nelson Mandela started by being silent. And then he paid attention by listening to the concerns of people on both sides and saw what they needed and attended to that. And in due course, negotiations would resume. And eventually, after four long years, South Africa 
had its first free and fair and thankfully peaceful elections. On April 27th, 1994, 20 million people lined up to hear or to have their voices heard. Most of them had never voted in their lives before. Many of them stood in lines for more than 24 hours, so desperate were they to be listened to, to have their country pay attention to what they really needed. When the results came in, Nelson Mandela was our new president. The old South African flag was lowered and the new South African flag was raised, representing the many colors and races coming together in unity in what the world now called the Rainbow Nation. Our new national anthem was sung, Nkosi Sikaleli Africa. It's the only national anthem on the entire planet that's sung in five different languages, representing just some of the many dialects and languages that made up this new South Africa. People started to call Mandela Madiba. Isn't that an awesome word? Madiba. It's an affectionate word meaning father in his native tongue. But for me, the hope of this new South Africa and the magic of Madiba wasn't clear until a year later. In 1995, South Africa was to host the World Cup of Rugby. We had been banned from the sport for many years because of the apartheid government. But now, with Mandela as president, we were back and we were hosting. Mandela saw this as an opportunity to bring our country together. Because previously, rugby had been a sport in South Africa that was exclusively played by white people. In fact, there were a few black people that played, but not many, and not many black people supported the game. In some ways, rugby was a symbol of the apartheid government. Nelson Mandela paid attention and he saw that what we needed as a country was to heal. And so he threw his full force and support behind the national side, behind a mostly white rugby team, despite the advice of some of his closest confidants. Beyond our wildest expectations, we made it to the final. And I was lucky enough to be in the stadium that day. The journey to the final was extremely hard fought, and the game itself was equally hard with just a couple of minutes to go before full time or before the final whistle in a game that had gone into extra time. The two sides were drawn 12 points each. When the ball came to South Africa, it came out of the scrum, was passed to the fly half who caught the ball, stood his ground and drop kicked the ball towards the posts. And as that ball flew through the air, time stood still. But as it went over those posts, for the winning points, the crowd erupted into a scream and a shout and a celebration like I've never heard in my life before. People were jumping up and down. The noise was almost deafening and it went on for five, for 10, for 20 minutes before we became, all of us, a little exhausted from the effort. And we started to calm down, but no one left because it was time for that trophy to be awarded to our captain. And when Nelson Mandela came on to do just that, wearing the rugby jersey of our national side, the Springboks, that crowd roared like I've never heard a crowd before. It became not this time somewhat deafening, it became literally deafening. I became overwhelmed. And it was like the entire stadium became silent for me. And as I looked around the stadium to try and take it all in, I saw for the first time in my life, black men and white men hugging, celebrating our nation's victory as one people. That day, Nelson Mandela gave us all hope, gave the whole world hope. That's the magic of Madiba. And that's magnetic. Now I get it, we're no Mandela's, but we can each put empathic listening at the forefront of our customer service efforts. How? By asking our customers 
the kinds of questions we ask them every day, and then listening with our hearts. By a show of hands, who's ever bought shoes from Zappos? They're known for massively scaling the online shoe selling business and for their extraordinary customer service. <coughs> Unlike their parent company, Amazon, when you call them, they want to listen. They want you to call. How do I know? Go to their website, top left-hand corner, you'll see their customer care number. They want you to call because they want to listen. When you do, you will hear a message that sounds like this. Thank you for calling and for letting the customer loyalty team put a little Zappos in your day. If you'd like to hear the joke of the day, press five. Five. Yesterday's joke, how do you make an orange smile? Tickle its navel. When you do go through to an operator, they answer almost immediately because they want to listen. They overstaff their call center just so they can do that. The average call time is about 12 minutes, unlike or similar to other call centers, but other call centers manage that number down, whereas Zappos doesn't care how long you spend. In fact, they're very proud of their longest call in history, 10 hours and 51 minutes. <coughs> A little old lady from Queens called in. And over that marathon call, she shared her entire life story about partying in Manhattan at the IT Club at the time, Studio 54, with Andy Warhol. Over those 11 hours nearly, she and her call center operator shared stories about their favorite vacations. They laughed together. They cried together. And yes, they took a couple of toilet breaks together. And at the end of those 10 hours and 51 minutes, do you think she bought any shoes? Yeah, she did, of course, that's why she called. <laughs> but that transaction was completed in the first 10 minutes. See, Zappos call center operators are trained not just to hear what people want, that's the transaction. They're trained to pay attention to what people really need and to attend to that, and when they do, people fall in love. Even when they phone in and they're angry about something going wrong with their shoes, they become captivated by those call center operators. So much so that for that person who called in after the call, their purchases of shoes skyrocket compared to before. That kind of listening is good for business and that's magnetic. Now we've heard about some amazing really magnetic human beings today and the habits that made them so. But these three habits can make each of us, transform each of us into magnetic superheroes. I challenge you to practice one skill every single day for the rest of the year with the intention of getting better, with feedback from a coach that knows what excellence looks like and even by asking feedback from your customers. If you accept this challenge, you will rise to stand out from the crowd. People will be drawn to you to see you perform at the very highest level. That's magnetic. I have a couple more questions for you. Will you ask more questions of each other? Will you ask questions of your customers? And especially and counterintuitively, will you ask those questions of your customers that sound like asking them for advice on how to solve their own problems? Because if you do that, you will unlock greatness in them and they will flock to you. That's magnetic. I invite you to listen with your heart. Begin with being silent. Then hear not just what people say, but pay attention to them so you can see what they really need. Because if you attend to both those things, people will fall in love with you and be irresistibly captivated by your presence. You will become magnetic. Magnetism is not some born-in gift, some natural genius, but a talent built by these three habits. Magnetism is a creation, and being magnetic is only something that we are because it's something that we do. Or as Aristotle probably should have said, we are what we repeatedly do. Being magnetic then 
is not an act, but our habits. Thank you. My question for you is, which one of the three habits that we talked about is your favorite and why? Easy, asking more questions. <laughs> and especially because I get to listen to the answers, <laughs> which is a good segue. Anyone like to ask a question before we leave? I have a question about, uh, you, you emphasized having a coach so much, uh, but I know there's been some, or lots of great people in history who, uh, as far as I know, were self-taught. I don't know, like, I don't know who was the coach for Einstein, for example, or like in some areas it feels that uh, a person could be their own coach or could not. What's your opinion? I think the better you get, the more likely you are to be good at being your own coach. But I think if you dig behind these people's careers, you're likely to find a father, a friend, a mentor, or someone who was in the background guiding their practice until they were good enough to, to become their own coach. Got it. Thanks. My pleasure. Hello, I'm Natalie. Um, so I ended up watching a TED Talk having to, I think it was Simon Sinek, not sure how to pronounce his last name, but he emphasized the nonverbal actions connected with listening and how when you're listening to someone that like nodding or giving that type of influential nonverbal behavior detracts from someone fully being able to share with you. What are your thoughts on that? I don't agree with that. Okay. Because I think that when someone's looking at you, if they're nodding along, it's a signal that they're paying attention to you, which is what we're really looking for okay. in a listening partner. Now, if they're sort of saying, yeah, 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 I get you, and they're trying to force you along, of course. But there's a lot of science that says that empathetic actions, meaning mirroring what you do back to me, helps us connect. It releases oxytocin in our brains, which is the trust hormone. And that builds relationships. And also, it's another side question, because I know you use a lot of uh, sense-oriented language, like really being able to kind of get people in the zone with what you're sharing. Are there like any authors that influence the way that you either speak or write? Hundreds of authors, yes. Yeah. Your favorite? Uh, Les Brown. Okay. He is a professional speaker. I think he's originally a pastor, but he has this amazing voice and this laugh that just makes you want to melt. He's extraordinary. I aspire to be half as good as he is. Buzz, thanks for coming. Thank um, you. My question is actually a segue to what you were just talking about. Something that I want to do and, and get more feedback on is public speaking. Um, do you have a suggestion for kind of how to practice that and get feedback on that on a daily basis? Other than practicing it and getting feedback? Right. Yeah, well, I mean, how. I'm in meetings every day, but it, it feels... When I think through it, it feels a bit awkward to, to like ask the people in my meetings to give me feedback on my speaking in the meetings, but, but maybe it's not. Maybe. It is awkward. <laughs> it is awkward. Yeah. And it takes a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. But what you'll find, I think, is that it becomes less awkward. The more feedback that you get, the better you get. The more confident you'll feel, the less awkward it will become. Okay. And find someone who is similarly interested and recruit them as your coach. You don't have to have an expert speaking coach, although that's helpful. You can have someone else who builds their competence with you. Okay. My colleague, Tia, is now my speaking coach. Oh. She's been working with me for three years now and has become an extraordinary coach and was not a speaking coach before that time. That's great. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Pleasure. So I was going to ask who your coach is, and you just... <laughs> um, but it's only three years, and it sounds like, obviously, you've had a longer career. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your coaches, perhaps, and how you identified them as a good match? Yes, I have a couple of coaches. The first one, I spent a year looking around the world for the world's best speaking coach. And unbelievably, I found her in Chicago. She's a Hall of Fame speaker. She's just celebrated her 76th birthday. And she is an extraordinary and phenomenal woman. Her name is Mickey Williams, and she has taught me more in the last two years, and I've grown more than I did in the last 25. And then I have several other coaches who I use for different things, like the transition between stories, which I'm currently working on, and a couple of other things. I've got lots to work on, but I find having several coaches is good, but having one main coach is best. How do you establish that it's kind of mutually beneficial? Because it almost seems like you're asking a lot from them. So how do you make it so that it seems worthwhile for them to 
Well, two them. ways. One is to pay them. Sure. <laughs> if they're professionals, okay. and many are. And the second is to reciprocate, to be coaches for each other. Yeah. Tia's headed to her sister's wedding in three months' time. She will be both the MC and delivering the Maid of Honor speech, and I am her coach for that. It's payback for her coaching me for the last two months. Thank you. So thank you. This was great and incredibly engaging. I was actually at Kellogg with Wartman, and I noticed a lot of similarities in your storytelling. Um, and I have a question, which is, how often do you find that you're falling out of your own habits? And like, do you recognize it right away, or do you have any like, tricks to like, get back into the swing if you sort of like go off course? Do you mean since breakfast? <laughs> About 30 times a day. And yes, there is a trick, which is to have a partner. So apart from being my speaking coach, Tia and I have what we call a willpower contract. She looks after my alcohol consumption. So if I have more than one, she like slaps it out of my hand. Also cookies, if you see us in the cafeteria later and you see a cookie on the floor, that was Tia. And I'm her partner for habits that she's working on. And here's why it works. I have infinite willpower to tell you what to do. I can do it all day long. I'm indefatigable. But for myself, I'm a bit of a mess. And the same is probably true of you. Mm -hmm. So if we swap, we suddenly both have infinite willpower. And I think the other thing is give yourself a break. Like, no one's perfect. And when you do fall off, that's the most dangerous time because what's likely to happen is the what the hell effect. Which is, well, I've had a piece of cheesecake. I might as well have all of that two glasses of wine and a tub of ice cream. You need to pull the brake after the first failure and say, it's OK, get back on. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. Hi, Andrew. Thank Hi. you for your talk. I'm Amir. Um, so I, my question is about listening with the heart. Um, a lot of times when we're listening, we kind of like have the intent to respond, or we have an objective or agenda in mind. How do we, what, what, what do you recommend for kind of turning your mind off and opening your heart when it comes to listening to somebody else? Yeah. Well, the first thing I spoke about, which is decide that you're going to speak less, that speak last. Mm -hmm. And you'll find if you make that decision, it makes it a little easier. It gives you the opportunity to listen. It does, though, take some practice because it's such a natural thing to just want to respond as soon as you've got that idea. So the second thing is to notice that you have a second voice in your head that's speaking the whole time. And it's saying, oh, I got one. I got one. I want to say this. And just to tell it to shut up for a while. And then when it comes to listening with your heart, it sounds like it's a soft thing. I think it's nothing more or less than if you pay attention, suddenly you start to see the look on someone's face. The mirror neurons in our mind prime us to feel the same way. Unless you're psychotic, we feel what other people feel when that emotion shows up on their face. So it's not hard to do. I think what is hard to do is to distinguish between what people say which is often a, an attempt to hide how they feel, and instead to look at what their face says, which reveals the truth. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So there are ways that you've given us to practice or encouraged us to practice being a better listener, but is there any advice you can give in order to encourage somebody else to be a better listener, and that's without giving them unsolicited no one, feedback. Not naming but... any names, right? <laughs> no. Okay. I always find it's easier to help others change by asking them to help us to change. So you might recruit this person as your coach and say, let's practice listening. Here's an exercise. I'm going to say something to you, or rather, you say something to me, and my job is to reproduce for you exactly what you said that's active listening. To try and identify how you felt, that's sympathetic listening. And to try and discern what you f are really concerned about, what matters below all that, that's empathic listening. And you practice it with them. After a while, they'll say, can I have a go? And you'll be on the journey to creating <laughs> a great listener. Thank you. Let me know how he does or she does. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think that concludes our talk for the day. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you.